The will to DIY is one man's Sisyphean task to ask questions of why. Welcome back. All right, we have now gone from the Panopticon to the post-Panopticon and off to surveillance capitalism now. But first, I wanted to lay a little bit of a grounding or a framework for how to think about technology's inevitability uh, and how surveillance capitalism arises from that and how if you rethink the way technology is used, neither one of these need to happen, right? Um, if you kind of consider things like memetic ideas, sort of mind worms that get inside of us, and there's this kind of ideology that's part of them, and eventually it can become an ontology. And I'm kind of considering that a pervasive way of life. It's really shaping the way people think to the extent that they become incapable of seeing another path in front of them. A primary example of this is religion. Well, globally, religion is on the wane, so that makes it easier for us to talk about it. But this is an ideology that it once was super powerful, but now it's no longer as powerful. And it's being replaced by something like humanism or individualism. Uh, in some camps, it's a return to nationalism. There's capitalism, communism, post-structuralism, all these isms. Well, these ideas, these have become mimetic mindworms, ways to think. Now they can sort of hold sway with their acolytes and their apostles and their priests, these people who proclaim them as law and truth. This is the way the world should work, right? Logic be damned. Uh, but there's sort of a more prevalent and unquestioned belief system. And it's a sort of modernist notion of progress that we all assume we need to be progressing all the time. And progress comes through efficiency, as we all know. And technology seems to be the means to more efficiency and thus more progress. So... Oddly enough, disciplines like math and science, which got us there, rather than being really a discipline unto themselves now, they're increasingly reduced into ways to support technological growth and expansion. So what happens here is we've co-opted other disciplines, but th this becomes kind of a blend of things where efficiency masquerades as progress while also manifesting this kind of dark capitalistic desire to maximize profit by abstracting human labor into these process tasks, much as we discussed with Deleuze previously. Somehow we have accepted this process of techno-industrialization as inevitable, and even as good, while our ability to have any kind of agency or informed consent over our lives or our work, it's really systematically removed. In this way, it can function the same as religion. This is Tech can be a tool to control the masses. Just invoke that sort of big tech is the way of the future and it's going to save us from our environmental sins and our folly. Uh, we can even point out our shiny toys. We can look at Google Maps and say, well, this made my life easier. And then we conveniently accept this kind of trade-off, making peace with the darker side of tech. It's kind of a Dr. Strangelove, how I learned to stop worrying and love the inevitable situation. But let's not forget, as Andrew Feenberg mentions in Questioning Technology, humans created technology. And now for some reason we serve it as if we did not control it or make it. So in that way, it's just like religion. We for some reason see it as essential, wherein it is not. The essential efficiency of tech progress really sets it at odds with social consequences. Yet the left and the right, they both deplore the state of society while championing this ideology that's busy dehumanizing citizens. It really sets up this people-to-objects relationship as an ends-to-means relationship, when really none of this is necessary if we just really rethought how tech could work. But now let's get back to the tech. The rise of technology can be mapped out in such things as Moore's Law, where the amount of transistors within an integrated circuit will double every two years, so there's really this exponential curve to more and more tech hardware. So we produce more and more hardware, which runs more and more software, which records more and more digitized data. Well, how much data are we talking about here? Well, it's said that 90% of the data in the history of mankind was generated in the last two years. That's an insane exponential curve. But also, we really need to consider the value of this data. What is this data that's being recorded? And for me, one way to kind of think about this is to step back into the 90s and really consider what's being put out there and how it was handled. Well, things with like with books, well, you had a system of publishers vetting the content that was released. But this really diminished with the internet allowing anyone to get online and say almost anything. So the floodgates opened and vast quantities of not good but really shitty content flooded the world. Uh, and in the midst of it, of course, there was some good stuff, some very valuable things. And you would hope that all that would rise to the top. But there's also just a lot of junk that flooded the world. What becomes interesting when the internet was kind of newish is... When you contributed your thoughts or feelings on something like a blog, 
it could actually have an impact, right? Because your tears could be seen. And over time, there's sort of become this river of tears because there's too many people now. And now when we cry, we're basically crying our tears into an ocean of other tears. Now, if you think of this in like a classic economical model, sort of a gold standard idea, every tear that's cried makes every other tear less valuable. It sort of guarantees their disappearance. And at some point, every person's activities seem to get lost amid this, amid this flood. That is until someone, <coughs> Google, uh, figured out how to really use and pinpoint all this data. You can pinpoint your tears in the ocean, the, the needle in the haystack. So now when I type in something like how to in the Google search bar, what I'm thinking I want to type in is how to mortise hinges for a door, but what I get instead is how to quit crying, almost as if they've been listening to me. And it has this really handy link on there. It has tissues to Amazon so I can purchase something. This type of product development is way beyond a product just collecting enough data to make itself function better. It bleeds into this new practice that Google pioneered where they found that there were these extra elements of data that they could collect as you were navigating things. And maybe they didn't really know what to do with all this data at first, but they figured out that this was really mapping out behavioral patterns for humans. So this extra data, this data that you were unaware you were providing to them, this is called exhaust data. And it's beyond what they needed to actually make the product beneficial. After collecting enough of it, these companies, with all of their processing power and magical algorithms, they can now, with a certain amount of accuracy, predict your future behavior. And worse yet, they have figured out how to manufacture a desired outcome to manipulate you. So typically that might be a purchase, but it could also be your vote. So this ability to predict or manipulate your behavior, well, it's valuable. It requires an infrastructure of widespread surveillance assemblages, which are recording machines, that basically map out your desires and behavioral patterns, and then these systems can work to also modify them. And this is what we call surveillance capitalism. It's the ability to extract behavior from users and then sell it or use it to make sales or do something else with it. This term was really coined by Shoshana Zuboff in 2014, and this process is mapped out thoroughly in her 500-page book. It just maps it out ter in terrifying detail. Zuboff says, It is the global architecture of computer mediation, which produces a distributed and mostly uncontested new expression of power. She calls this power Big Other, as a nice little nod to Orwell. But it's this kind of darker form of an obfuscated, unknown, and mostly unrestrained kind of corporation that has hidden desires and agendas that we don't know about. And unfortunately, these corporations developed this model, and they've pioneered digital theft without informed consent, of course. And that has inspired our governments to start using the same techniques, such as when the NSA does their warrantless surveillance of citizens. So really, the issue here is, where do we draw the line? When is it okay for a corporation to spy on you without your consent or your government? Or is it okay to take whatever you want as long as someone clicks the accept button on a thousand page terms and conditions document? Is it really okay to spy on me and record my conversations when I don't know you're doing it and sell my data you secretly collected to some third party overseas? Is that okay? And this is the other funny thing about this. Let's not pretend this is new terrain. All of these questions were asked to Congress back in 1997, but no real policies or oversight ever manifested. So I'm not sure if that's due to incompetence or big corporate money and lobbyists protecting their new economic transaction model, but yeah, that's what it's about. And there's this odd little fact that humans seem to have very short memories. And unless we feel a certain amount of pain, we don't seem to react. We just sort of unconsciously adapt and then we accept the new norm. We here at Control Corp wanted to take a minute to reassure you. There have been some allegations in the news about us stealing and selling private information to Russia and China. And we'd like to assure you that was simply a rogue engineer that put that code in all of our systems across the entire globe. And we're doing all we can to discredit her and ruin her life because we care about you. In the meantime, Control Corp is still the friendly, do-no-harm company we always have been. Just listen to a few members of our happy family team who completely trust us and love the embedded tracking devices we have installed in their heads. Karen, tell me what you love about Control Corp. 
totally like Control Corp making a data double on me. My avatar tells me what I would look good in, and I don't have to really think about anything. My life is easier when all I worry about is what my friends are doing on social media. And, I, you know, really, I can't afford to hang out with them after buying all these clothes and maxing out three credit cards. <laughs> but, you know, I've really never been dressed better or more alone in my parents' basement. <laughs> <laughs> oh, that's great. And Paul, how about you? <laughs> Who cares if I'm recorded? I really have nothing to hide. I don't do anything illegal. And I really feel like if anyone heard my conversations, my, these are just jokes and they wouldn't be taken out of context the way that it happens to everybody else. I mean, hell, any CIA agent would laugh his butt off at my jokes about getting rid of that doofus in office. Blam, blam. <laughs> Take that mother effort. <laughs> so see, you heard it here, folks. Nothing to worry about. We're the same trusted family team that has always cared about your safety and works to make your life easier. Be sure to edit out that part by Paul at the end. Thank you. Part two. So one of the insidious things that Zuboff talks about is how companies have grown more and more subtle, how over time they acclimate us to their ends. I mean, we were threatened and screaming about privacy when they first started tagging our faces and pictures using facial recognition. So they backed off, repitched the idea as a cool new option, and a few years later we're now happily tagging our friends and family in every picture we upload. We think it's our idea, and yet we're joyfully verifying the facial recognition that they already have on us. In 2012, Facebook ran an experiment known as, uh, by some as a transmission of anger. They offered up either positive or negative ads on people's feeds to manipulate their emotions, and then they tracked them. Not surprisingly, negative ads made people more negative online, and vice versa. This breach of ethics to manipulate us like this, it's bad enough, but they've also been perfecting facial recognition tech that can read the emotions on users, from sad face to angry face to happy face. So yes we're eventually all just reduced to emojis. This aligns with Judith Deportil's book, The Love Algorithm, where she maps out how the algorithms the Tinder dating app employs really just stereotype people, but also about how they use a design of addiction through infinite possible matches, recording all your messages, and then she discusses this moment after this New Year's Eve party where she felt kind of lonely and she was highly active on Tinder, only to suddenly receive ads for a sexy leather jacket whenever she's her most vulnerable and in the most need of validation. She doesn't think this is a coincidence. But let's really get some context here. There are evolutionary social core human needs and desires. To be loved, to be part of a community, to be respected, to have some share of equality and prestige. These, along with lust, fear, and vanity, have long been some of the targets of advertising. Unfortunately, it seems that we have not yet built up an immunity to online manipulation. Uh, people talk about internet literacy, things like that. And these companies are very subtle about how they use it. They let you think that your desires are your own, not the ones that they prime you with. An example of this from Zuboff is the app Pokemon Go. It's secretly, of course, owned by a Google sister company, and Google's now a subsidiary of Alphabet and blah, blah, blah. But this is just an example of this kind of obfuscation and legal complication that make this kind of field even trickier to enforce laws or policy on. So anyway, back to it. Pokemon Go has people navigating the streets chasing digital rewards, and they're going to these Pokemon gyms at select locations. And in the biz of making this happen, this is known as footfalls. So anyway, it's great. People are getting outside. Their feet are falling, but it went from a digital transaction to a localized step. And then all of a sudden, you're playing this game, and the on-screen rewards are pictures of milkshakes. And the third reward stop happens to be inside a McDonald's advertising milkshakes. Well, these are known as lure modules. So right now, you haven't really had a milkshake since you were 14, but today you suddenly have one in your hand. What, what just happened there? That's weird. In the biz, they've really proven now that they can move your online patterns, your anger, your hunger, your desire into real-world actions in real-world locations that they determine in advance. So this is the real key reversal that we should fear. In books like Ready Player One, there's this virtual world, this oasis. It's a utopia that's this creative playground where you can really avoid real-world poverty. You can escape your real life. 
And this, I think, was kind of one of the original dreams of the internet to have a democratic platform with equal access and knowledge. Um, and this could go around the globe where you can meet others and be with them. And it sort of built out this digital, more perfect world. Of course, we've now been accustomed to the idea of being surveilled and stalked and manipulated by ads while we're in this world. But in sort of a naive sense, we always kind of thought that that world and the supposedly benign surveillance really stayed online with very little ability to affect our real world lives. But increasingly, the mission and what's actually been happening is these lessons gleaned online are fused into real world panopticons. They're merging post-panoptic tricks with gamification to better serve capitalism or corporate greed, however you want to call it, through this kind of indoctrination and re-education, or as Foucault may say, discourse and examination. A key example of this is Walmart, aka the beast from Bentonville, and their transition into this panopticon of time. And mostly this just means that they're using technology to control time efficiency through intensification and intimidation. And there's an entire paper on it that I'll post in the um, website. Thank you for coming in for Walmart's mandatory rehabilitation course. Ryan, you seem to be having trouble. We heard you say the other day, and I quote, we have a shop floor totalitarianism. This really hurt your uncle Walmart. He has really been good to you. As you know, we have to keep you at part-time status so that we don't have to pay for your health care benefits. And that was all Obama's fault, despite our record-breaking profits. Also, we would like you to know we appreciate the six years of overtime that we can't afford to pay you for. But as you know, we have to keep costs low for our consumers. That's a Walmart promise. However, what we wanted to talk to you about today is that our computers tell us you have stopped to breathe or get a drink of water while working. You know that that is stealing from your Uncle Walmart. What? You don't get paid enough to have water at your house? Well, Ryan, if you stopped wasting time drinking our water, we might be able to promote you and give you a raise. But really, this gets back to the reason you are in rehabilitation. We worry that you're really not bought in, not loyal to our family team, after 20 years working here. We would love to promote you, but our tracking software doesn't think you are reaching your potential. And given the billions we have spent on technology, whatever it says must be right. Computers are much smarter than you or me. Part 3 This type of corporate community, with precarious part-time workers forced into cheerful subservience while being watched by digital pit bosses? Well, this is simply the new norm in America. And I've even heard that it comes from uh, Vegas, from gambling. That's how a lot of this was pioneered. And increasingly, corporations such as Google are setting up these campuses where people live, work, play, shop, similar to Vegas again, and essentially they need a pass to leave. This is this kind of new panopticon that's drawn from post-panoptic lessons. This was all foreshadowed in Margaret Atwood's Mad Adam series, one of the bestest topic series ever. And this really showcases how corporations and their tech create this local utopia, these little gated areas for the loyal elites, while the rest of the masses outside the gates are in poverty and they become subjects for these increasingly unethical products and experiments. These corporations command loyalty. And they offer protections to people that, for some reason, the nation is no longer capable of. But they also ask for much, much more in return. So, there are always more examples of surveillance capitalism gone awry. But we're going to end on these sort of most pernicious abuses by China. First off, they have invested very heavily in tech and cameras. We're going back to Moore's Law here, right? We have the cameras, we have the software, we're going to record data. They end up creating this kind of smart city of interconnected devices. This is the rhizome thing again, right? And these are all watching and tracking, these surveillance assemblages. And this is all ran by the government under the guise of safety. And once this infrastructure is in place, how do they use it? 
Well, they now have a community that practices the social credit system, where social interactions give you a positive or negative score. This is similar to a Black Mirror episode. And your trustworthiness score either provides you benefits or forces burdens upon you. So what are the burdens? Well, if you have a beard, maybe you're suspected of being a Muslim, and then you must attend a social camp to be reindoctrinated to Chinese propaganda. These small interactions and this kind of constant tracking leads to a fear-based state that's meant to eradicate any dissenting ideas or culture, just to weed them out and keep basically your foot on their neck. And the sort of harsh corollary of this that's even more visible is their treatment of the Uyghurs, where they have used facial recognition to profile and track this mostly Muslim minority ethnic population, and they attempt to keep them confined via facial tracking software. Tracking someone is really not new, but racial profiling and discrimination has historically led to very negative tragic ends, and currently, China has even began forcing sterilization of Uyghur women against their will. So, that's a dark spot to end. I will have some links on the site for you, and of course this won't be the last time we touch on these topics, but I feel they're really necessary foundational elements that we should consider if we want to build a better world. Until then, try to get into the shop and make something.